Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. Oh, when the same, when we get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Oh, when the same, when we see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Oh, while we walk the pilgrim path, you know the clouds will overspread the sky. But when the traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. Oh, when the say, when we get to hell, what a day of rejoicing that will be. I know that when the say, when we see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to those that are at home, watching on YouTube. So, pleasure and an honor to be standing here in front of you this morning. If you have your Bibles, we'll turn to Romans chapter 7, about verse 14. Romans chapter 7, about verse 14. Romans chapter 7, verse 14. Here I want to talk about a, it's an ongoing battle that we go through each and every day. And uh, no matter how long we are Christians, sin is trying to re-enter our our lives and take over. And it's amazing how quickly it can come back to us. People who get a little excited and you've heard them say, I lay down my religion because now they want to curse you out. Sin can come back to us very quickly. Very quickly, we can remember or resort back to that person that we no longer desire to be. That's what sin can make us do in the blink of an eye. The passage we're going to study, uh, explore in Romans is one of the most um, applicable in Romans, but it's also one of the most controversial ones. Uh, people have been studying Romans for a long time and uh, they always debated just what experience Paul was referring to in these verses, verses 14 to 25. But Paul's main point in this section is undebatable. The law cannot free us from spiritual death. So there are three main possibilities. Some people think that Paul was uh, describing his life as a Jew under the Mosaic law. Others think that Paul was describing his experience as an immature Christian, and some think that Paul was describing his experience as a mature Christian. But let's begin with three observations about this, this, this famous text. Observation number one is this. Romans 7 is a passage that grips us because we understand exactly what it's saying. We can see ourselves in Romans 7. When Romans 7 is read, everyone understands and says, amen. Yes, that's right. That's true. That's me. Observation number two is Romans 7 seems to tell us about the Christian life as we actually experience it much of the time. I don't think that Paul's discussing the life of a person before they are a Christian. I don't think Paul is describing the life of an immature um, or a carnal Christian. In my opinion, Romans 7 is describing the experience of all Christians, both mature and immature, as we experience the ongoing battle with sin and the flesh. When I read Romans 7, I saw that my own personal experience came out in Romans 7. 
And, it's, and it rings true to me about the personal experience of people I see on a daily basis as a preacher. When I read the text, I noticed that Paul constantly says, I, I, I. And it's not past tense, it's present tense. It seems to me that we have, uh, we have here, what we have here is not Paul's theory, but Paul's actual experience of the Christian life as he lives it day by day, year after year. Observation number three, though some of us would perhaps wish it were, were true, there is no escape from Romans 7 in the Christian life. There is no escape from Romans 7 in, in the Christian life. There's no real escape from our ongoing struggle with sin. But we must keep in mind that Romans 7 is not the whole story. Because Romans 7 is wedged in between Romans 6 and Romans 8. And um, uh, those lay the, the groundwork for the Christian's triumph over sin in this life. Romans 7 describes a subnormal Christian life where the, the battle with sin is mostly one of failure, some people would say. They would also suggest that mature Christians should get their lives um, together in Romans 7 and stick with Romans 6 and 8. But I believe that Paul is presenting a unified viewpoint of the Christian life of which Romans 6 is a part, Romans 7 is a part, and Romans 8 is a part. Romans 6 says that we have died to sin, and Romans 8 says that if we live by the Spirit, we put to death the deeds of the body. So the fact that Romans 6 and 8 uh, talk about victory, that doesn't mean that the, the Romans 7 struggle won't be an ongoing one. If I could put it in one word, what Paul describes in Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 25, I would use the word, the word struggle, struggle. There's other words we could use like conflict or war. But struggle, conflict, and war, that's what Paul says was going on in his life as a follow, follower of Jesus. I think we would say that that is what is going on in our lives as Christ followers as well. We experience inner struggles, inner conflict, and inner warfare. Paul says in this passage that the problem is not simply sin on the outside, but the problem we have or, or, or we have to face is sin on the inside. The problem is not simply temptation out there, but temptation in here. For all of us as believers in Jesus Christ, sin is not something that simply is outside of us. But here Paul is saying that sin is something that we must wrestle with daily on the inside. When our when our hands do wrong or our eyes do wrong, mainly probably for men, when our eyes do wrong or uh, our feet or our lips, our feet when we go places we shouldn't be or our lips when we say things that we shouldn't say, the problem lies deeper though. Sin goes deep, but, but Christ goes deeper. Why is it that there's this struggle inside of every believer? And the answer is very simple. It's two words, indwelling sin. Look at the text in um, Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, verse 14. Let me get there as well. In verse, seven, in verse seven, uh, 17, Verse 17, the Bible says, Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. He uses the same phrase in verse 20. If you look at verse 20, Paul uses the same phrase. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Sin dwells inside the life of every Every Christian, even though we are followers of Christ and have the Holy Spirit, we will never be completely free from the pull of, of the sin that is inside us. As long as we are in our mortal bodies, the, the flesh, we will wrestle with sin. 
Because that man or that woman that you're constantly trying to dispel or put away is always clawing at you trying to get back out. Trying to get back out. And, and that person that we're trying to bury has triggers. We, has triggers. People that will try to make you let that person rise back up. That person that you're trying to crucify, there's triggers. There's people that try to get at you to make that person come back out. A very person you're no longer striving to be. Um, when we examine this text, we notice that it falls into three parts. Three different times Paul confesses his own personal struggle with sin. And each one of those confessions reveals a different aspect of the struggle we face as believers to live victoriously for Jesus Christ. The first aspect of, of our ongoing struggle is the struggle to live up to what we know we ought to be. The struggle to live up to what we know we ought to be. When you enter a dark room and you turn on the light switch, what is the first thing that leaves? What do you say, Sister Manuel? Darkness. Why? Because darkness has no place with light. That's why some people don't like you. Because they can't stand your light. When you walk in there, your light shows them that they're not living up to what they ought to be. They're not what you are. Or they wish they were. But you're showing them up. So they don't like you just for that reason, and you may not even know these people. But they don't like you because darkness has no place with light. When Paul wrote in verse 15, for I do not understand what I am doing because I do not practice what I want to do, but I do what I hate. Now, if I do what I don't, do not want to do, I agree with the law that it is good. So now I am no longer the one doing it, but it is sin living in me. That's uh, verses 15 through 17. Paul began with this, this amazing confession. I do not understand what I am doing. Look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. Look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit. And the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that you would. Because that conflict is going on, sometimes that's why we cannot do the things that you would. Because that war is between the spirit and the flesh. The, the spirit is after godly things. But our flesh is after worldly things and sinful things. And so this is a constant, this, the Bible says here, these are contrary the one to the other. Now look at Romans 8. Romans 8, um, verse 6, I believe it is. Romans 8, verse 6. Here we go. Romans 8, verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. We hear, we hear children say all the time, I do not understand what I'm doing. We hear children say that all the time. A child might throw a rock through a window or break a toy or hit their sibling. And, uh, and, and when you ask them why they did that, what do they say? I don't know. I don't know. And sometimes we as adults are not much different. There's times in life that we do something sinful and foolish, but when we are asked why we did it, the only answer we come up with is, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Why did you go to that place? I don't know. Why did you click on that website? I don't know. <laughs> why did you break that promise? I don't know. Why were you with that person? I don't know. We might answer, I don't know, to the question of why, but the real answer is, 
I allowed sin to take over. I allowed sin to take over. When you were caught in the wrong place doing the wrong thing, you have allowed sin to take over. Because the spirit would not have led you into that situation. That is your flesh and its lust that put you in that situation. Here Paul is saying, Paul confessed, I do not practice what I want to do, but I do what I hate. Here Paul's confessing the struggle within his own soul. He's saying that he feels like he has a split personality. And Lord, don't I know some people with split personalities. <laughs> oh, depends on what day you catch him. <laughs> depends on what day you catch him. He's saying he feels that there's a continual civil war going on inside his heart. Uh, William Barclay entitles his commentary on this passage, The Human Situation. And he's right, because this is truly the human situation. We know the good, but we don't do it. How many times have you had the opportunity to do something good for someone, but you didn't do it? But you didn't do it. We know the good, but we don't do it. I know I shouldn't be going in here, but I'm going anyway. I'm going anyway. You know, that girl's got me so mad. I really shouldn't say this too, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, we, write, we sometimes we like to rationalize sin. This one ain't so bad. You know, if I, if I say this, well, that ain't bad as what so-and-so was doing. We like to compartmentalize sin and, and rationalize sin. But God said, it's all the same. It's all the same. You know, a lot of times um, we know what's wrong and we fight against it and then we do it anyway. Y'all ever had that struggle? I've had that struggle that I knew it was wrong and I fought against it and then I went on and did it anyway. I did it anyway. We say, I will, and then we don't. We say, I will, and then we don't. We say, I won't, and then we do. That's what we, hate. That's what we do. Somebody once said that Paul must have been a golfer because a golfer can understand this principle. You say to yourself when you stand on the tee, uh, there's trouble to the left, so I'm not going to hit the ball to the left. I'm going to hit, hit it to the right, but you end up hitting the ball to the left where you didn't want it to go. It's the human situation the universal human experience. Now let's draw a conclusion from this first confession. Knowing and doing are two different things. Oftentimes we say, when you know better, you ought to do better. Some people know better and don't do better. Some people know better and don't do better. I can never forget. Listen, growing up, Children are going to make mistakes. We've all made mistakes growing up. Now, here's the, the difference. When your mother and father put the knowledge in you with which to make an intelligent decision, you're still going to make a mistake. But it's not because you didn't have the knowledge to draw on to make an intelligent decision. Today, and mostly today, we got the opposite. Children are making bad decisions because they was never put, the, the knowledge was never put in them with which to draw from to even make, consider making an intelligent decision. So that's why our parent, that's why your parent, your mother or father ever say to you, you know better. You know why they can say that to you? Because they'd already put in you the, the, the knowledge. That's why they can say to you, you know better. That's why they would say that. They didn't hear the teacher side that said to you, you know better because they had taught you. So we can know the right thing and we can still do the wrong thing. Knowing right and wrong is not enough. There must be something else, something deeper that works within us. And so 
The first aspect of our struggle is to live up to what we know we ought to be. The second aspect of our ongoing struggle is to come to grips with repeated personal failure. Now, Paul wrote in verse 18, for I know, Romans chapter 7, verse 18, for I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my flesh. Well, we just read a minute ago that the carnal mind is enmity against God. So, so it, he, he said, that is, in my flesh. So the flesh can't please God. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but there is no ability to do it. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I do not want to do. Now, if I do what I do not want, I am no longer the one that does it, but it is the sin that lives in me. Now look closely at verse 19. I practice the evil that I do not want to do. Keep in mind that Paul was confessing this as an apostle, as a follower of Jesus Christ. He said, I practice the evil that I do not want to do. The Bible tells us to love our enemies, yet we still go on hating them. I know I practice the evil that I do not want to do. Not because you haven't been told, because that's what you want to practice. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you can understand these words. We know the good we want to do, but we keep doing the evil that we hate. We keep doing the evil that we hate. Those who are truly born of God develop you got to develop in your heart a deep and honest and holy hatred for sin. Sometimes people say, how can you say you hate that? If God hates it, I hate it. If God hates it, I hate it. If it's no good for him, then it can't be any good for me. If it's no good for him, it can't be any good for me. It's said that the closer we come to God, the less we will sin, but the more of a sinner we will realize ourselves to be. So you got to keep in mind the truth that I've been talking about here. Just because a person is a Christian doesn't make them immune to temptation and immune to the pull of sin. The pull of sin. Remember when Christ uh, was tempted by Satan and after after the three temptations, the Bible says that the enemy left him for a season. Okay, so today, what we have? We have four seasons. We have winter, spring, summer, and fall. We got four seasons, right? So if Satan attack, attacks you in the winter and leaves you for a season, he may come back in the fall. He may skip spring and come back in the fall. But don't say he's going away permanently. It says he left him for a season which he returned again to tempt him. And so Satan, he, you may win the victory today for a season, but he's coming back again. He's coming back to try to tempt you again. And that's why um, we have this constant struggle because Satan's not going to give up. He don't give up easily. He's on your back all day, every day. He's after you all day, every day. He'll say, well, she did well with that one, but let me see if I can make her stumble with the next one. Because you're a Christian, doesn't make you immune to temptation and immune to the pull of sin. Because your own Lord and Savior was tempted by the enemy. What makes you think that you won't be? Your own Lord and Savior was tempted by the enemy. What makes you think that you won't be? That you have immunity from that? And the Bible speaks truth when it says there's no one righteous, not even one. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. In Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No one, no one has to convince me of the rea reality of indwelling sin. Not in the lives of believers of this church and not in my own personal life because I live with this reality every day. When I stand in front of the mirror, what I see is a man who struggles with sin every single day. 
it's hard for us, you know, it's hard for us as believers to come to grips with what Paul is saying here. We try to come up with spiritual formulas to get us out of Romans 7. Like, do A, B, and C, and then you will never sin again. But I don't see anything like that in the text. What I see is that we've got to face the reality of Romans 7, or we'll never get to Romans 8. We've got to come to grips with repeated personal failure. And the first step in healing is to admit that you are sick. Just like the alcoholic, just like the smoker, just like the drug addict. They have to admit that they are sick before they can get fixed. Because why would you fix a problem if you don't have one? So until you admit that you have a problem, you won't fix it. A wise person once said, you won't, you won't fix what you won't confront. You won't fix what you won't confront. Healthy people don't go to the doctors. I don't go to the doctor when I'm healthy. I don't go to the doctor till I'm sick. And how about you? Because uh, I don't need to pad his pockets with another copay and stuff just for a friendly visit. So I don't go to the doctor unless I'm sick. Healthy people don't go to the doctors. Only sick people do. The people who are made better by the power of God are the people who are not ashamed to admit the weakness and the failure and the struggle that they are under, undergoing in their own personal lives. So the second aspect of our ongoing struggle is the struggle to come to grips with repeated personal failures. And the third and final aspect of our ongoing struggle is the struggle to admit the true nature of the war within. So look at Romans chapter 7 verse 21 for those that just came in. Romans chapter 7 verse 21, Paul wrote, So I discover this law when I want to do what is good Evil is present with me. For in my inner self, I delight in God's law, but I see a different law in the parts of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? In verse 21, Paul says, when I want to do what is good, evil is present with me. Present with me. In the Greek, that means right beside me. Right beside me. You've probably seen it on cartoons and things. When a person is getting ready to do something, the angel pops up on the right shoulder. Yeah, it's a good thing. You ought to do it. And then the devil pops up on the other shoulder. You ought to leave that person alone. Don't do it. Don't do it. And so this is a war that when I want to do good, Evil is present with me. It means I'm here and evil is glued to my side. It means I'm joined with sin like Siamese twins. Everywhere I go, evil goes with me. Just like the enemy comes to church too on Sunday. Not just the believer, but the enemy comes to church on Sunday as well. The enemy knows scripture just like the believer does. The enemy knows scripture. Evil is present. It goes with me. Paul uses this. Um, he says, everywhere I go, evil goes with me. Paul uses military terms to describe the struggle. Uh, when he says, like, w waging war and taking me prison. Uh, Evil is not only with us, but evil is also waging war inside of us all the time. And sometimes it traps us as a prisoner. If you haven't yet caught this point, let me, let me say it again. As long as you and I are in the flesh, we're going to struggle with sin. Because remember, you can, you can sin in word, thought, or deed. So you can say, well, I ain't drank no alcohol but you thought something about that person. Well, um, I, I don't fornicate with women, but when that girl went, went by with that nice shape, you thought something. Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> so we all struggle with sin. We all struggle with sin. 
We're going to, as long as we're in this fleshly body, we're going to struggle with sin. There's no amount of going to church that's going to change that fact. We must stop believing in miracle cures for the spiritual battle. There are no three-step programs that will free us from sin forever. And so here in Romans 7, we see a most godly man, Paul, admitting the truth about the struggle within his own soul. So if Paul struggled, it will happen to me and to you as well. We're going to struggle. In this lifetime, we're going to struggle with this. The most critical battles are not the ones on the outside. The most critical battles are the ones on the inside. They're the battles that nobody else ever sees. Nobody else ever sees. It's the struggle that goes on in our minds and our hearts between the pull of the flesh and the pull of the Holy Spirit. This battle goes on every day, even on Sunday morning. Why is it that we try to hide the fact that we are in a battle? When we come to church on Sunday, we look good, all cleaned up. But behind every smiling face is a story of struggle. See, a lot of times people, people look at a person where they're at. They may have a nice job, a nice car a nice home. But you don't know the struggle they went through to get that. See, all you see is the finished product. Well, you know nothing about the struggle it took to get there. Some people, when you see their daughter or their son a college graduate, but you don't know the struggle they had to go through to get there. You don't know how many nights when you sat home with a hamburger and french fries, they was eating ramen noodles. You don't know how many late hours they put up and put into it. You don't know how, how hard each of their parents worked two jobs to, to afford the money to send that child to college. So you, you see the finished product, but you know nothing about the struggle. You know nothing. Um, some of us barely make it to church. Spiritually, emotionally, physically, in every way we've struggled through the last seven days to get here. And you know what? That's okay. It's a struggle to come to church and admit the truth. We'd all rather think, I look good, you look good. So I don't have any problems, and you don't have any problems. But the truth of the matter is that healing cannot begin until, until we can say, there's a battle inside of me. I'm really struggling and I can barely make it. Romans 7 reminds us that when we are really struggling, then we're in good company. Then we're in good company. I don't know about y'all, but there's a lot of stuff that goes on during the week. And so when I come in here on Sunday, I got to get regenerated. I got to get released from that foolishness, <laughs> you know, and I got to be replenished by the word of God to go the next seven days. And so um, what I'm saying is that the spiritual battle is real and we need help from God and from each other. Fellowship is part of being a Christian. If you don't like the fellowship with people, you're missing out on that part of your Christianity. Because even in the early churches, people went house to house. That's fellowship. That's fellowship. You can't be a Christian and be antisocial. Because that's what Christianity is. I need help from you and you need help from me. And I need help from you. That's part of Christianity. No man is an island. Christ didn't make us that way. God didn't make us that way because in the beginning he said it's not good for man to be alone. So you ain't supposed to navigate all this by yourself. You need your brothers and sisters. You need the family of God as well as the help of God. What I'm trying to say is that the Christian life is a series of ongoing battles. We're going to win some. We're going to lose some. We're going to be knocked down and we're going to get back up. We're going to keep on struggling and through the help of God, we're going to one day win the battle. 
The final victory will come when the battle is over and we are in our heavenly home. But until then, we can walk in significant victory, but the war will rage on because the enemy is not going to stop. The enemy never sleeps. He won't stop. And so we're going to have struggles. Even the best saints of God are going to struggle. Even the best saints are going to struggle. So allow me to conclude with three things that will help us in our ongoing struggle. Paul suggests three things in verse 24 and 25. Romans chapter 7, verse 24 and 25. He said, "What what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with my mind, I myself am serving the law of God, but with my flesh, the law of sin. The first thing that helps is honesty. Paul admits, oh, wretched, what a wretched man am I. And, and we know from reading about Paul, all Paul did for the Lord. But he said, oh, wretched man am I. Honesty. The truth about ourselves can hurt. But unless we deal with the truth, there is no help. Unless we deal with the truth, there is no help. Unless the drug addict says, I am an addict, there is no help. Unless the alcoholic says, I'm an alcoholic, there is no help. Unless a person says, I'm not living right, there is no help. There is no help without honesty. And the second, uh, the second that help. The thing that helps is humility. Paul said here, who will rescue me from this body of death? Honesty says I am a wretched man, but humility says I cannot save myself. So those that say, well, I'll come to to church when I get myself together, you can't save yourself. You cannot put yourself in in the right enough position before coming to Christ. You cannot. Because Christ said, He said, without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. Anything that I do, anything I do since I became a Christian is not me. It's the Christ in me that allowed me to do it. It's not me. It's the Christ in me that has allowed me to do it. He gets all the credit. And, you know, for some of us, when we stop taking the credit for our accomplishments and the things that we do and start praising God because he enabled us to be able to do those things, maybe we'd have a little better life. Stop taking the credit. And then we have honesty, we have humility. You know, Satan licks his chops when a Christian tries to win the battle alone without God or without others and within his own strength. Satan's are licking his chops. But Paul concludes in saying that the third thing that helps is heaven. And he concludes by saying, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I use the word heaven because it begins with an H. Preachers like alliterations. (laughs) Heaven stands for help from above through God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Remember the Bible says all good things come from above. All blessings are in Christ Jesus. And this morning, if you're not a Christian, you can receive those same spiritual blessings that we've been talking about. How can you do that? By hearing the word, believing the word, repenting of your sins, confessing Christ, and being baptized for the remission of your sins. And then you'll be privy to the help from the Lord. Remember, you can't make it through this journey by yourself. Contrary to popular belief, we all need Christ and we need him every day. I need him beside me every day because wherever I go, evil is present. And so I need him to be present. I need him to be present. So this morning, let's get ready for a great worship. I hope um, those at home have um, received something from this lesson this morning. I hope we all here have been edified by this lesson this morning and know that we all struggle, we all struggle with sin every day. But Paul tells us how we can overcome it. Thank you this morning.